Hi, everybody. I'm just waiting to see if uh, some more people jump in. I know that it's like just about a minute before 3.30 uh, p.m. my time, 6.30 on the East, East Coast. So I'm just waiting for a few people to, to pop in. I hope you guys are all enjoying your Tuesday. <laughs> um, if I sound a little bit raspy, if my voice starts to kind of go a little bit, it's because I, um, I am sick. I don't have COVID, but um, I tested positive for rhinovirus. Um, so I have the common cold, uh, which, you know, is miserable, but it's no COVID. So I'm thankful for that. <laughs> How's everybody else doing? Anybody, anybody have anything to say? Anyone want to? Jump in and say anything really quick before I start. It's okay. It's, it's okay if it's a quiet group. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna get started really quickly. Uh, first of all, my name is Kara Lunsford. I am the CEO and founder of Holly Blue, uh, which is a community uh, for nurses and a technology. We have an, a, an app. And uh, we basically, are, our mission is to build a vibrant community where nurses thrive. And I've been doing this business for the last three years. And uh, I was very excited when I, I was speaking with Faith and she had asked me to talk about my experiences uh, in doing a startup. Because uh, from a technology standpoint, uh, investment standpoint, just all the things that you have to, to learn and navigate as you're uh, building a business. Uh, I, I've been a nurse for 14 years. Uh, I did not go to school for business. <laughs> and so I had to learn so much of this um, on my own and through consultants and advisors. And, and so I'm really excited to actually share with you a bit about my journey and some of the things that I learned and the things that I would do better, I would do differently. Uh, so that hopefully as you guys are, um, you know, going out and, and building your own businesses, or maybe you already have built a business that, uh, that maybe I can shed some light on this. I also want this to be very dynamic and, you know, a Q&A type session. So I did make a lot of notes because I wanted to make sure that I, I hit on certain things. Um, and that I didn't forget anything that I would want to share with you. So I did, I did make slides. I did make notes. There's no pretty pictures on them. There's no cartoons. <laughs> it's just kind of me, you know, making sure that I'm hitting all the points I want to hit, but then I would really like to turn it over and, and, uh, have more of a Q and a session, uh, for the majority of this webinar. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see this? I guess you can kind of raise your hands if you can see it. Okay, great, <laughs> that's perfect. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Okay, so, so you had an idea, now what? 
So to succeed or not to succeed, that is the question. Um, as many of you probably know, of course, we all want to succeed. And, you know, many startups and many businesses don't succeed. And so I wanted to touch a little bit on why I feel that people succeed and, and, and why maybe they don't. Um, so in the beginning, it will just be you and your great idea. Millions of people all over the world have great ideas. Success is promised to no one. It is not always the hardest working person who is the most successful, and it is not always the laziest person who fails. It's not nearly that black or white. The ability to know when to push forward, when to wait, when to respond, when to seek advice, when to be humble, and when to speak up, to remember to place importance on the journey and not solely on the destination, this is the delicate balance that you will be trying to strike every single day. Some of you might ask, can I do this alone? You know, I have this great idea. Um, I don't really want to have any partners. I just want to do this all by myself. Um, well, the answer to that is, is that when you have an idea, of course, that, that idea is always going to belong to you. This is what makes you the founder of your company. Great ideas require execution. Execution requires a team. And a team requires that the right roles are filled by the right people. Your original idea can be made so much better with the right team. Embrace the changes, but hold on to your mission. I say this because it's incredibly important to understand the why behind your idea because the why behind your idea is the base of building your mission statement. Your mission statement is your North Star. When you get lost and can't see the forest for the trees, you will absolute, which will absolutely happen, your mission statement will be your lighthouse. Every single decision has to pass the most basic question. Does this fit within our mission statement? For Holly Blue, our mission statement is simple. Let me make sure that I'm, I'm admitting everybody here. For Holly Blue, our mission statement is simple. Building a vibrant community where nurses thrive. And our vision, a world where empowered nurses transform the industry in which they serve. So I always like to say to people when they're talking about uh, building their own company or executing their idea, nothing great ever came from a comfort zone. So when we like to stay in our comfort zone, when we're afraid, when we are fearful, uh, oftentimes we don't see great things happen. So bringing a dream into reality, breathing life into an idea, well, it will be one of the hardest things you ever do in your life. It will also be one of the greatest things you ever do. You will discover things about yourself that you never knew. You will discover things about other people in your life that you never knew. The struggles you will face will make you question your sanity, and they will also make you stronger than you could ever imagine. So, as you are building your team, you might have to ask yourself, do I need co-founders? Or can I just find consultants who will help me to execute this idea? When I was having to work with Holly Blue, I originally had a lot of co-founders, I actually had two co-founders and, and an investor who was also considered a co-founder. So there was four of us. And in the beginning, I just thought, you know what, these are a couple of people that just really believe in my idea. But what I failed to recognize was, are these two people that can help to execute my idea? So how do you decide if you need co-founders or if you need consultants? First, ask yourself if you are the industry expert or if there is another expert that is required to execute your idea. You have a great idea, example, you have a great idea for a piece of technology that will change the lives for all GI patients. Do you have the ability to create this technology on your own? Do you have the expertise in gastroenterology? 
Uh, also, will you be looking for outside investment or will you be self-funding? And if you will be looking for investment, what will an investor be looking for in a team? This is a really important question because when you're looking for investment, whether it be angel investment, venture capitalism, or any of this, they're always saying that it's the team that they're investing in. I used to think that, hey, I'm working with a lot of people who are really awesome people and they all really believe in my concept. So this must be enough. This must be the team that investors want to invest in. And that's not exactly true. What's true is that they want to make sure that the people that are on your team, the co-founders that are on your team are capable of executing the job or the role that you've placed them in. So for example, is this a team who is personally invested in the success of the company while also having the education and ex expertise to execute the idea? So for example, if I have a piece of technology, then one of my co-founders should probably be somebody who is in the technology field, somebody who is a coder or a developer, programmer of some type, someone who can be the CTO of my company. Have you or one of your team members had a successful exit or had past experience building a successful startup? So one of the things that investors also look at is, does anybody on your team have a really great resume? Have they already been a part of another startup that was already very successful? And which shows that they have a proven track record of being able to help your company or help a startup become successful and eventually have what's called an exit. So if your idea requires a second or third subject matter expert separate from yourself, selecting co-founders might be a good idea. Reminder, your co-founder doesn't have to be your friend and probably shouldn't be. They need to be a good cultural fit for the company, believe in the mission, have the time and energy to spend and have the skill and exp expertise to execute. So once you've de decided whether or not you are going to just be a sole entrepreneur on your own, or you're going to grow with, with a co-founder or a partner of some kind, then you have to decide how you're going to form your company. Are you gonna be an LLC? Are you gonna be an S Corp? Are you going to be a C Corp? I can't stress enough the importance of seeking counsel before establishing a company. Many founders in a race to be first to market create an entity, divide equity, and trademark their idea without any legal consultation. First, ask yourself, am I rushing through this process out of fear? Am I afraid that someone else has the same idea and I don't want them to beat me to the market? Taking your time and getting the appropriate advice to make good decisions without overthinking every action is your first and most important task as an entrepreneur. Everything you build moving forward will be on this foundation. So please don't rush. So here's a big question that a lot of people ask. Should they just self fund? Should they just put in all the sweat equity or should they bring in investment? So the answer to this question is actually fairly simple. Time, risk and dilution. So time, when you, and if you decide on a co-founder, decide to build out your concept and create your MVP, your minimally viable product, it will take time. If you are both independently wealthy and, or you don't need to work full time, you might be able to execute this fairly quickly. For 95% of us who don't have that kind of luxury, you will likely be doing this in all of your spare time and spare time is very subjective. Here's a disclaimer to this. The majority of co-founder issues arise due to one person feeling that they are putting in more time, money, or both. 
if their risk and work are not reflected in their shares, there will likely be issues that arise. These expectations can be clearly spelled out in a founder's agreement before moving forward with the company. So for example, if you have a really great idea and you're going, you know that you need to bring in a co-founder, you don't necessarily have to be 50-50. You can be 70-30, you can have all kinds of different arrangements where you are going to feel like if I'm putting in the majority of the work and the money and taking the most risk, then you're going to want to feel like you have the majority of shares in your company. If you feel that the company in terms of financially, work, risk can be divided equally between two people, then it is you know, okay to do a 50-50 split. So risk, if you decide to leave your full-time job or you decide to use your savings to start this business, you are deciding to take on a certain amount of risk. This risk can be financial, but it can also put an added stress or burden on your family. There may come a time when you may feel what's called pot committed, a term used frequently in poker. You have so much invested in the game that your judgment can suffer and you can subsequently make poor decisions. Dilution. You don't have to risk everything in your life to be successful. Dilution doesn't necessarily mean that you are giving away your company. Sometimes it means that you are giving your company and your life the best chance at success. So last but not least, after all of that, you can do this. Make sure that you ask for help when you need it. Humility can be your greatest asset. There are times when you will need to pivot. Your ability to be dynamic and flexible can be what paves the road to success. You can have all of nothing or part of something. Bringing in the right people and giving them skin in the game, equity, can bring a kind of success that you never even dreamed was possible. So I'm gonna stop my share for now and I'm going to open it up. I see that there's people that, um, it looks like a couple of people were maybe in the waiting room. I'm sorry if they missed that, but um, I think Faith is also on here. Faith. I think she's letting people in as, as oh i can't i can't you, you've got that control kara so you've got a oh i control. only have all the control you Wait, have all the control i'm sorry you gave me all the control oh no it's really hard to invite people in as i'm talking <laughs> yeah i'm sorry it was just like well, yeah. you know what what we can do is just let them all in right now let them all in right now i think so. i did i think okay I, think I let them all in okay i think i already did i did stop in the beginning and let some people in and then right. i think a couple of people that were kind of hanging out. What I'll do is we'll kind of do a Q and A, and then I'll just very kind of quickly kind of go back through those slides. I won't read through them, but I'll just touch on them at the end of this in case there's anyone who maybe missed the first part of that. Um, so I wanted to uh, to see if anybody had any questions or wanted to raise their hand. I know that there's like an ability here for people to. Yes, there. Is. Yep, there is. There's a. Um... So if in the um, I need to see like a chat. Yep. So yep. Right. Okay. So, then so there isn't a there. They do have the ability to raise their hand and, and um, so okay. we can put them in queue. So exactly. And I'll, I'm going to start with the first question. So okay. <clears throat> I, I don't I'll, let me introduce myself. I'm Faith. I run the oper day to day operations for Sanciel. And um, prior to coming to Sanciel, um, uh, met our Rebecca Love and I um, worked together at Higher Nurses, so um, which was a nurse based um, two nurses coming together with her mother, um, and thank God, God bless Rebecca's mother. So I always say, like, like you said, it's the passion. Like, so my question to to um, to Carrie is like, I knew what drove Rebecca and I every day because we wanted to get nurses recognized and recruited for the first time ever. 
because nurses and you know they're never recruited so that was like our drive every day i'm like you know what i'm going to change the dynamic of this and i want to make nurses get, give them a different platform so that was like you said that was our mission like every day it was that was my drive every day i got up and i said this is what i'm going to do and um that worked for me you know like that gave me sticking to that mission and sticking to our vision um was very important and before when we sold the company we sat down many times with many companies that approached us and wanted to buy us and we shot them down constantly because they did not have our mission or vision and i cannot tell you how important that is because when you have to turn like the keys over to somebody else that is the hardest thing ever to do um especially when you've been doing it from scratch um but so what drove you to create Holly Blue? That's my um, question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can agree with you more that when you, uh, when you create a company, especially when you create it from such a, a passionate place, uh, your company becomes your other child. I have an almost nine-year-old in the back room there, and then I have Holly Blue. <laughs> and I, you know, I would probably throw myself in front of a bus for both of them. <laughs> so it's, it's so incredibly true that uh, the reason I created Holly Blue was because I had worked in pediatric oncology for the first eight years of my career. I've been a nurse for 14 years. So for the first eight years, I worked in pediatric oncology and I experienced an incredible level of burnout. And then I watched all of my coworkers also burning out. And I realized how important it was for us to be able to have something that was ours, some, a community, a peer support, a place where they could find mentorship. And I realized that, you know, that, that technology was the way that that was happening. People were coming together through technology. The other part of it was that I also wanted people to, to be able to meet through technology, but I wanted to be able to create real um, relationships, which on Holly Blue, you can actually meet nurses that are nearby to you, geographically nearby to you, connect with them, go to coffee, meet up at a Starbucks or a local coffee joint that you, you know, that all of the, you know, I wanted to take those online relationships and be able to take them offline. And I also wanted to make sure that they had so many things available to them from, you know, events, podcasts, uh, you know, self-care seminars. And, and so I wanted to have everything kind of all in one place. So that was why we, we created, created Holly Blue. We also did a survey of nurses of like 1300 nurses during COVID and they all ranked 75% of them ranked peer support as being the number one thing that would help with the sustainability of this profession. And so that really spoke to me as well. And it told me, yes, we are on the right path. We're doing the right thing. But like you said, Faith, I love the nurse community so much. My whole focus is trying to do something for, the, for nurses that can uh, help them to sustain this profession, not just sustain it, but really actually thrive and restore their passion for nursing. And so, uh, if somebody were to just come in tomorrow and say, um, I'd like to buy Holly Blue. Well, it's, it's not that easy. <laughs> they, they, would they would have to understand the mission of what we're doing. And, you know, there would have to be a lot of uh, conversations about how um, that mission has to continue. And, uh, and, and I would probably have to have a a very large role or part in uh, how the, the operations of things moving forward, even if there was an acquisition at some point in time. So uh, yes, I, that, is, that is where my passion came from. And I also was a director of nursing. So I was uh, working in a leadership position as well and watching nurses burn out and watching how hard it was to get nurses to even want to take jobs it was, you know, not so much whether or not they, there was enough nurses to work. I used to say, 
it's not whether or not there's enough nurses to work. It's like a willingness to work. Do they want to work? It's they're burned out and exhausted. So um, I wanted to, to uh, uh, Christian uh, has, has a question. Um, do you want to unmute yourself, Christian, so I can? Hi. Um, well, I think you've kind of gone off in a different direction for now. So maybe I'll ask it, ask my question at the end because you may cover it. So I'll, I'll put my hand down for now. Oh, I, I, I'm not sure that we're going in a different direction. I think we're just answering questions. So I was really just answering Faith's question about what, where, you know, what my passion was or drive was behind creating my business. But um, we're answering any questions. So shoot. <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to start a business myself. It, it does have to do with technology. It's something that I invented. Um, so I kind of wanted advice on that. But like I said, you're, it sounds like you're going to cover it probably. So um, no, no, Christian, go right ahead. Like I said, it was just me starting the conversation because sometimes it's just hard to start the conversation. So please ask your question. Go right ahead. Yep. Well, I mean, it's kind of like, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah. Um, because I can't, I, I made a prototype of the thing. It's a, it's a monitor and um, it's a non-working prototype and I don't know how to make it do what I want it to do. So I need to find, like you said, I need to find some good partners um, that can do the technology part. Um, for me, and so I, I've been I've been real protective of my baby because I'm scared someone's just going to take the idea, you know. So I'm like, how do I find people? How do I trust people? How do I protect myself? And yeah. should I go to these big, you know, manufacturers of uh, medical devices, or should I try to start something new? Um, yeah. All great questions. Those I. <laughs> all those same questions. I, you know, I was in the beginning, like really afraid to talk about my idea because I thought, well, if I talk about it, then someone who has more money or more expertise or who can implement it is going to take it. And then, exactly. and, then and, and it is, it's a very real fear. So, you know, there are non-disclosure agreements. So what you do is you get a non-disclosure agreement you know, and oftentimes I will tell you that when you go to, you know, reputable, reputable people, you know, they don't, their business is to execute things like this. They are waiting for people to come to them with ideas and they, and they want to partner up with people like you. It, for them, the idea of being able to possibly be a, a, a partner or a co-founder with you or something like that, that's enough skin in the game that they don't need to run off with your idea, you know? So, um, you know, having them sign a non-disclosure agreement ahead of time to say, I have an idea I'm starting to interview people uh, who can help me to, because you have to date these people. You know, when, when you're finding a co-founder, um, you're marrying them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a marriage and, it, and, and it's for the long haul. You know, so, you know, it, it's not that you have to be, you know, overly uh, concerned, but you do want to kind of date them a little bit and, you know, and, and ask a lot of questions. I mean, I, I did work with like my CTO before he became my CTO. I did work with him as a consultant for a few months before. So he signed a non-disclosure agreement. He worked with me as a consultant for a few months. I really liked his work ethic. I really um, liked the, the, the quality of the work that he was doing. Um, he really believed passionately in, in what I was doing and in my, in, in my product and, uh, and in my company in general. And so at some point then I felt like, you know what, I can't really continue to kind of pay this guy on a consulting basis. But what I could do is I could offer him a percentage of my company and he now is going to become my CTO. And he came on for 10%, just, you know, in all transparency, he was my CTO for 10% of my company. Now you have to, you know, you have to negotiate that with people. You know, if you, you know, they might, you might offer 10% and they might come back and say, you know, there's going to be a lot of work here. You know, you haven't really done that much. I had done a little bit 
already, I had, you know, I'd already worked with a development company. And so by the time he was coming in, I kind of already had my minimally viable product. Uh, but if someone's going to come in and basically build it with you, you know, they might want 40% of, of the company. But if, if you believe in them and they believe in you and you think that they have the time and the expertise to be able to do it, then it's better to have a product than to not have a product. But your non-disclosure agreement is pretty much the thing that's going to protect you. It's going to make you feel more comfortable about talking about your ideas and everything before you, you know, and, and they, they'll expect to get something like that from you. Just say, here's, here's my non-disclosure agreement before our meeting on Tuesday. Could you sign and send it back? Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I had thought about them and I didn't know if that was enough protection. It is. It's, it's about as much as you can get, you know, so no, nothing is promised, right? Like we can't, but if we are, if we're too afraid, we'll never get anything done. Exactly. You, know, there, you have to be cautious and you have to be smart, but you don't want to be overly afraid because overly afraid just means that you'll never do it. And then somebody will actually think of it and come, you know, and do it before you. It's a little bit of a balance. <laughs> You know, and when you Mike, just so I can interject here just a little bit. So, like you said, you have a, you you have the idea. You own one hundred percent on the company in the beginning, and this person comes and says, "Well, I can do the tech at forty, but when you have to turn around when you're negotiating, you go, "Well, how's your marketing? How's your fundraising? Like, you know, what I mean, like, because remember, we have to be able to give away more of the company going forward. Saying, "Well, if I own sixty and you own 40 are you going to be able to bring investors because you, you're telling me it's going to cost X amount of dollars to build this out? Yeah, you can, are you, if you can't do it with, can you do all of this? And if so, if you're going to need more help on those other ends, remember, we might have to cut you back down to 30% because we still have to give away that 10% for what you cannot do. So those are always things that you can think of in the background because when you're sitting down and you're talking about like the big picture, um, you know, it takes a lot. Yeah. It, you know, so, and, and so when you're saying, oh, I'm giving this, like, you feel like you're giving your hard work away, but you're going to reap so much in the rewards and the, and the, on the back end. And it is the hardest thing. And I will tell you as a nurse, um, giving up that control because it's like your patient, you know what I mean? Like, this is your patient, these are your orders, I'm gonna do this, this, and this, and and you wanna save your patient, like you wanna save your business. But you really, it's like, you gotta think of it as a team, like you need the respiratory therapist, you need um, the CNA, like, so I always say to nurses, look at it like it's your patient, and how would you take care of this patient? Yeah. Well, you know you can't do it all, because you work with a tribe of nurses, and a, and, a, and a team of support staff. So you're going to need that support staff yep. going forward. You just got to be smart about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't have said it better. It is like a multidisciplinary uh, team <laughs> when, when you're building, when you're building a, a product or you're bringing, you know, this dream to reality. Um, that is exactly um, what you're what you're doing is you're trying to build out that ideal multidisciplinary care team. Who's the best doctor you could have thought of? The best respiratory therapist you could have thought of? All of these people, like you know, it's it's so incredibly important. But you know, when it comes to a business, you have to think about you know, an investor's going to look at you and go, okay, you're building a piece of technology. You're the you're the you're the uh, the the expert in terms of you're from the medical field, you know what is going to work for patients or for nurses from a medical perspective because you're on the front lines, you know exactly what's needed. So you're the expert in that area. But then they're gonna look and see, well, who are the other co-founders? Who are the other partners here? And what is their background? Does this person have an MBA and they're in charge of your sales and marketing? Is this person, you know, over here, do they, you know, do they have a technical background and have they worked, you know, programming or have they run a company before or did they used to own a company for technology? You know, what is their, what is their resume? 
making sure that these people's resumes reflect their position. The biggest mistake that a lot of nurses do is that they get a lot of nurses to be their co-founders. And it's like, well, how many nurses do you need? <laughs> do you need four nurses? Probably not. You know, that's probably not the case, but we tend to like to surround ourselves with our own people because it's a, it's a comfort zone, right? But like I said, nothing great ever came from a comfort zone. Um, does, does anyone else have any questions? Um, let's see, I was, oh, I was looking here to see Mary. I see that Mary has a, a question. Mary? Uh, hi there. Hi. Um, thank, this is great, thank you so much. Um, I have a small business and I sell a product to hospitals and I have probably eight or 10 hospitals that consistently uh, repeat customers but I don't know how to move it forward from there. I thought maybe it would sort of organically spread, um, but that hasn't happened. So, and I work full time and I don't know how to market and get beyond where I'm at. So are you the sole, are you the sole owner of your company? Yes, just me. Okay. So, you know, you can do a couple of things, right? So you can bring in, um, a commission-based salesperson. Uh, so you could bring you could bring someone in who. Hi, Mary. <laughs> um, you you know you could bring in. That's like what I'm doing right now is I'm actually bringing in a salesperson, a commission-based salesperson. Sometimes you know they do want to have some sort of a base salary, and then you can create a commission structure. You know around a base salary. But if you actually have evidence that you've sold this product and you've had success selling it yourself, sometimes that's enough for a, a salesperson to come in and help you to, to ex because they have an expanded network. So you can look on LinkedIn, you can look, on, you can look in different places and try to find people who have a sales background. If, uh -huh. if you're trying to do more marketing and you just want more brand awareness, Mm -hmm. So you want, for example, more people to, um, to find out about you through um, what they would call like kind of a lead gen campaign. LinkedIn is very expensive for this, but probably your target market is more on LinkedIn than probably other social channels. So mm -hmm. advertising on Instagram or Facebook is probably not very not going to be very successful for you. But a lead gen campaign that you could do mm -hmm. on um, on LinkedIn can be very successful. Um, okay. And sometimes just working with a marketing person or a consultant, and I actually have a really great um, strategic marketing um, person that I work with, so I'm happy to give you her name. Her name is Alex Ruiz. Um, she can help you um, with a strategic marketing campaign and she knows like the cost and everything when it comes to um, marketing on LinkedIn. And you can do a lot of A-B testing where you test out different copy and you see which ones do well, which of your lead gens actually result in you getting, lead gens mean lead, lead generation, right? So they're gonna, it's gonna give them a form, it's gonna be an ad, and then when they click the interest on it, right? And, and it'll go out to just your target market on LinkedIn the people that you believe to be your target market and then it will go out to them and then they'll see the ad or they'll see the in mail and then they'll have to click something that says that they want to learn more or you know if they're interested and it, and it creates a form and it says like who are they what company are they from and you can make the form say whatever you want and then you get that information and it just gives you a warm lead somebody who seemed to be interested in your product based off of the ad that they saw on LinkedIn. Okay. All right. Great. Does that um, help a little bit? Yeah. Super helpful. Thank you. I, right now my LinkedIn page is my, I think I have my main job is my 40 hour job, you know, and then I also says owner, you know, of my company, should I just create a separate page or should I get rid of like the hospital based page? Um, you can also have a company page, so you should probably have a page for your company. Okay. Um, 
just solely like I have my personal LinkedIn mm -hmm. and then I have a company page for Holly blue. And so that way people, if you have in your, in, in your resume, you know, on LinkedIn that, you know, the first and foremost, that you're the owner of this company. And mm -hmm. second of all, you know, you also do all of these other things, then people will know that they can actually look on LinkedIn for your, your business page and, and learn more about your business. Okay. All right. And, and is that, so my LinkedIn right now is just the free LinkedIn. I have, so yeah. what I need. It, you might have to, I'm so sorry. That's my dog. <laughs> I have a dog. <laughs> no worries. I, I, you know, when you work from home and you do everything from home, you know, I'm navigating three dogs and a child. So God knows what's going to happen yeah. <laughs> on this webinar. Um, anything goes when, when during COVID times. Um, uh, but I having I can't stress enough the importance of actually investing in a social presence. Okay. Uh, it's it's kind of like the, when people go to look you up, whether it's on LinkedIn, whether it's on Instagram or Facebook. When they go to look you up, they they sum you up in that moment. Like uh, it's kind of like Yelp, right? It's like we always used to use mm -hmm. Yelp. All the time, and before that, we we've used we used other things, right? So, but Yelp was kind of like you go to Yelp if you want to know if a company is, you know, what what they're rated or what you know what their social presence is. Mm. Now, you know, people are your reputation is kind of rolled up in 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 your social presence, and and unfortunately on on Instagram, LinkedIn, and all of these things. So yeah. there, is, there is a value in, and because you're working full time, um, mm -hmm. and this is not your full time business. Sometimes you have to hire somebody to create those pages for you, create that presence for you. Um, because it can be a full time job doing that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. but it is important. It's important to have it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, see, let me see if anyone else has any questions on here. Uh, I got to move the chat down so I can actually see people. Uh, oh, I, I thought I saw somebody just come up, but now I can. Oh, uh, Jane. Hi, Jane. Jane, before I answer your question, I'm going to let my dog in so he stops making all those terrible noises. No problem. <laughs> My dog hates closed doors. Anytime I close a door, he just whines and whines until I open it. <laughs> Quite all right. Um, I'm sorry if you've already answered something similar to this. I've been kind of in and out of this meeting, um, but my name is Jean Reardon. I'm a, an emergency department nurse um, by trade, still practicing, and I also have a job um, as a director of support services for um, a parking company that actually has turned um, into um, more of a healthcare company. So more on that another time, but I think um, just kind of on the heels of Christian's question, um, when you're looking for something like the non-disclosure agreement, um, I guess like what reputable sources should you look at um, when you're kind of outlining your idea? Is that just like kind of a simple word document? Should you have it notarized? Or um, I guess I I've kind of gotten mixed reviews of like how to approach that and what um, protections you could possibly have in place and um, who is the best person without costing yourself a fortune and not really getting anywhere? Uh, you know, there are actually a lot of really like boilerplate non-disclosure agreements. You can get them off LegalZoom. And in all honesty, you know, they don't require a, a ton of, um, uh, I mean, the basics of a non-disclosure agreement is like, basically, I'm going to tell you something and you don't get to tell anybody else and you don't get to do it for yourself. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and so there's not a whole lot that's kind of built into a non-disclosure agreement. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so you're you're fairly safe to go with something pretty boilerplate. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What I do recommend is that when you're interacting with you know with people and you're and you're talking to you're talking to people who you think might be a potential co-founder or somebody who might just be like a consultant. In all honesty, you have to kind of uh, realize that if if their job is to be a consultant, and that's their that's their full time job, mm -hmm. they get these kinds of ideas all the time. Mm -hmm. Every day, people are coming to them with ideas. You know, one of my co founders when we were interviewing um, developers, mm -hmm. uh, she was so she was so afraid the whole time and they had even signed the non-disclosure agreement and she was like don't talk about that that's yeah. too <laughs> and i was like i'm like they this is what they do they develop ideas for people every day like every day people come to them we have to kind of remember that they're not going to throw away their company by stealing an idea right mm -hmm. it would be it would go completely against mm -hmm. what they're trying to do which is to be a development company working mm -hmm. for people who have an idea who need to develop it, right? Yes. It's, it's really counterproductive for them to like start stealing people's ideas. They'd be wrapped up in lawsuits all, you know, all mm -hmm. day long if, if that's what they were doing. So mm -hmm. it's not really their, it's not their bread and butter is to mm -hmm. just, you know, steal people's stuff. You know, when it comes to like, if you meet some guy at a party, and mm -hmm. he seems like, oh, you know, I do some coding on the side, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, and he seems like, oh, maybe he could be a good, um, a good fit, but he's like not working for a firm. He's kind of self-employed. He does like all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to be a little bit more careful because he doesn't have anything or she doesn't have anything to lose, you know, by, mm -hmm. you know running off with your idea but most of the time people realize that just because they can do or execute it they realize that it does take the founder because the founder is the person who has the soul right mm -hmm. they have the belief my cto actually said to me kara i actually tried to do something similar to what you're doing and i tried to do it a couple of years ago and i failed I completely failed because I was just a tech person. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any, um, I didn't have any heart or soul or, you know, I didn't understand the industry the way you understand the industry. He said, I just thought I could build a piece of tech and then, you know, the healthcare industry would just jump on board. And I, mm -hmm. and I, he didn't realize how much it takes mm -hmm. to actually make that happen. So I don't think that, you know, you have to be overly concerned. I think it's just do your due diligence, get something from legal zoom. That's like, you know, a basic boilerplate non-disclosure agreement. Most of the time, mm -hmm. the fact that somebody feels like they signed something is going to keep mm -hmm. them honest. <laughs> okay. No, thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's see. Is there, does anybody else have any any questions? Um, I I didn't want to dive in too too deep into you know just the operations of of having a business, but um, I think some of like the major some of the major things just that I have learned over time is you know bringing in investors. I've I've brought in personally almost $1.1 million in investment over the course of three years. And I currently own 38% of my company. So when I talk about dilution and I talk about investment and, and pitching and uh, angel investors or seed investors or venture capitalists, um, you know, I've had to pitch in front of all types of people like this. So, um, you know, if you have any questions around that or just even the legal, I had to get a really great legal team as well. Um, I, I can answer probably a lot of questions about that. Um, Christian, did you have an, you had another question? I think you raised your hand again. Well, that, 
I wanted you to kind of expand on that a little bit more about um, speaking with investors and how do you do that and um, how do you find them, et cetera? That, that's a great question. How do you find them? Are they like hiding under rocks? Are they like, <laughs> are they? Yeah. It, so I've done everything from going to mixers, which obviously doesn't happen right now. I've done the, the speed dating. I don't know how many of you have heard of like the founder meets funder events where basically you speed date um, different um, uh, investors and you have like just a couple of minutes to, it's like an elevator pitch. You've got like a couple of minutes to give very like high level, what is your idea? What are you doing? How are you changing the world? And why should they be a part of it? And you have to try and cram it in there in like a two minute speed date. It's, it's a great exercise. So I do recommend like looking into things like this because it definitely hones your skills a little bit. But one of the first things that you really wanna do is that you want to start building out a pitch deck. A pitch deck is different than a business plan. It's basically an abbreviated version of your business plan because unfortunately venture capitalists are like five-year-olds. They like pictures, <laughs> they like it to be short, and they want the takeaways very quickly. They, it's called WIFM, right? Like what's in it for me? You better get to the point really quick. What's the problem, right? What's the problem you're solving? What's your solution? What's your target market? Like what's your total addressable market? Like how much money is, is in the pie? And how much do you think you can get of it? And then, you know, what is in it for them, right? So these are like kind of like the, these are the points that they want you to, to hit when you're, uh, when you're doing a pitch deck. A pitch deck is probably like 12 pages, 12 slides. You know, your business plan is a much more expanded version of that with a five-year pro forma of, you know, how much you think you can charge, what the market will bear, how many, you know, of your total addressable market, what's your target market, and how much of that target market do you think you're going to get in the first year? You know, being really conservative is important. If you go in and you say to an investor, um, there's 500 hospitals in my area, and by next year, I'm going to have 250 of them. You probably won't get any further in that pitch than like, there's just like, that's ridiculous. You're not going to get half of your target market in a year. So like being very conservative and saying, you know, in the first year, I think I could potentially get 5% of my target market. And by year two, I think I'll get this. It's all, you know, so, so really around pitching, pitching is making sure that you have a good pitch deck, making sure you know your product inside and out, making sure your product fits your mission statement. And then, you know, being able to deliver that in a very fluid way. And, and you can join, there's actually a company called Scale Health. I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with Scale Health. But Sanciel is really great because Sanciel has access to a lot of um, investors, a lot of people who are interested in investing. These are people who come to these hackathon events who, you know, are some of the judges, you know, are potential investors. So, you know, being part of Sanciel is really great because they do have access to a lot of angel investors and uh, seed investors and venture capitalists. Uh, does that answer your question, Christian? Good. Yes, thank you. Great. Um, I see. I see that Jane and Mary still have their hands up, and I'm not sure if you still have a question or if you want to. Do either one of you still have a question, Jane or Mary? 
I don't. I'm trying to put my hand down. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, I also, do. sorry. Yeah. You, oh, you're trying to put your hand down as well? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I totally get it. Um, yeah. It, it, I, I also think that it's really important uh, I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I don't know if any of you want to hear my mistakes, <laughs> but I, I mean, I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. I, um, I divided up my company into quarters. I 25% across the board uh, for, you know, four co-founders. Um, two of them were basically like well, three of them were really my friends, but one of them brought in the majority of the money in the beginning, which was about $300,000 in the beginning. Um, it was, you know, it was my idea, but I didn't have enough confidence to believe that I could execute something so big by myself. And that was my lack of confidence that, that, it, that made me want to bring in two other people but I wasn't, I, I wasn't smart enough at that time to know that, the, that I should be bringing in other people, but I needed to bring other people in who had the skill and expertise to execute the product. So that was like one of my, I mean, and this is nothing against my, my co-founders, they're lovely, lovely people. And, I, and I, I, I love them for the work that they did in the beginning, but we realized very quickly that um, we needed people who were much more adept and skilled in the areas that we needed. It was like, we were just giving people names. It's like, well, you'll be the COO and you'll be the CINO and I'll be the CEO. <laughs> like, and it was just like titles for the sake of titles, but it wasn't like, you know, any one of us necessarily had, had the skill and expertise to be able to, to carry out those roles. So, um, that was like one of like my, my first big mistakes. Um, you know, uh, because I didn't have a CTO in the beginning, but yet I was a tech company, I just brought in a developer thinking, well, you know, I'll bring in a developer and the developer, I'll pay the developer to do all of this work. Well, it's kind of like, you know, if, if I don't speak the same language or I don't know enough about development, how do I know if they're overcharging me? How do I know if, you know, they're not interested in telling me whether, you know, like this, you know, this is too costly or this is being done right or this is not being done right. Um, I didn't know any of that because no, my, my co-founders weren't uh, expertise. They, they weren't experts in technology. If I had had a CTO and we were hiring uh, a team of developers, he would have been able to oversee them. He would have been able to say, no, it shouldn't take that long. No, it shouldn't cost that much. No, you know, it, this is not acceptable. You know, he would have been able to do that and held them to a certain level of accountability but I didn't have that. So I ended up paying a lot more and getting a product in the beginning that was actually very archaic and sub subpar. And I paid a lot of money for that. And, you know, to the tune of $275,000 <laughs> for that. And, you know, that's a painful lesson to learn and to have to like go back to your investors and say, Hmm. Well, I didn't know the right questions to ask. I didn't know how to hold them accountable because I didn't have the right people on my team. So, you know, that's, you know, and that's just like probably one of my first mistakes, <laughs> like, but I've made, but your mistakes are, it's okay to make mistakes because as long as you learn from them um, and, you know, being able to pivot because essentially I will tell you that one of the greatest things I ever did um, was about a year ago, I realized that the product that we had did not speak to my mission. 
I had been listening too much to the developers and I had been listening to what they thought I needed to have and I lost sight of my mission. And about a year ago, I basically had to decide to scrap a $275,000 piece of technology and start from scratch. And it was very painful. <laughs> but sometimes you have to do that because if I had gripped on too tight and I had held on to it because I was pot committed, as I, as I said before, you know, sometimes you're so invested, you have so much money, you have so much time that you risk making poor judgments. It's, in, it's incredibly important to know when to be dynamic, when to pivot. And because we did that, we saw a growth. We were at like 3,000 nurses who had joined Holly Blue. Today, we're at 16,500 in a matter of six months. And it was all because we pivoted. And I, it was all because I basically made the decision to scrap a piece of technology that was not working and was not speaking to my mission. Does any, does anyone else have any, I'm so interested to hear what people are working on. Does anyone want to share their, I mean, we know we don't have non-disclosure agreements on here, but we seem like a pretty safe bunch. <laughs> um, you know, does anyone want to talk a little bit about their ideas or, you know, just a high level um, of, of what they're, they're working on? I don't see any. Well, you, in, in, Kara, this is a great, um, you know, like you said, pivot. Pivot is huge. Like, <clears throat> you know, as of beginning of, you know, uh, March, you know, Sansale had, you know, has its mission and vision and all of a sudden we had to majorly pivot because of COVID. And, you know, we started the SHARE program and which was amazing. And I've learned more about the other supply business than I could ever imagine. When I tell you like innovation, you, you want to be able to, you have to keep that broad um, open mind is so important because I learned so much and the rest of us, a couple of the, you know, the, 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 the a couple of other founders and committee members that were on that like daily call every day. Um, you know, as of last week, we facilitated over 350,000 pieces of PPE in like 90 days. Like that was like talking about taking like, okay, you know, this is what you have to do. So sometimes that, that pivot move, like just opened up a whole new, opens up a whole new world. Like you said, so don't ever be afraid to like jump into something that you're, uh, don't think that you don't have enough knowledge about because you can always research and then reach out to somebody. And then it opens up so many doors. Like when I tell you, eventually we're going to do a, um, um, Julia Cooney, Ann Cochran, Rebecca Love, and myself are going to do a talk about, you know, like what what really transpired during the, the, the share program, because that just gave us so much more, um, opened the doors for so many more things for Sansiel in the future, which is like, you know, I mean, we made Nightline, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Rebecca Love made Nightline just for that and, and and what we've also learned and other doors that got opened so just because you think oh well this is really what i i started out for don't be afraid if somebody says to you can can you just come look at this because it life-changing it's really that that five minute phone call five what do you think or somebody's opinion i'll tell you is it's just life-changing i i cannot i I cannot agree with you more, Faith. It, first of all, removing fear from your vocabulary when it comes to building a business is like number one. Like if you're operating from a sense of fear, nothing, nothing successful builds off of it. I promise you that. And exactly right. Because yeah, you can be cautious. Yeah, and but you can be cautious, right? Because like. To, to, to us when it all happened, it was like when I, we were getting all the emails and I was getting all these emails and I'm like, 
how can like for us it was like how can I help all these nurses like I need to help yeah. So it's just like, so, but sometimes, but I also learn so much simultaneously. It was like, I got an MBA overnight <laughs> in the supply chain, you know what I mean? Like in hospitals and, and learning that the reason why the hospitals couldn't order extra supplies is because they have contracts with certain suppliers and those suppliers did, ran out of supplies, but they can't breach their contracts. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah, it's amazing. So those are opportunities like when someone says can you come to a hackathon or will you attend this meeting or will yes. you listen in on this conversation say yes saying because yes is such yes. a huge thing like I, I will tell you that probably I, I'll tell a couple of like really fun stories because there are like some major things that have happened just out of like pure like the universe just manifesting and allowing things to come into my life. But it always happened because I showed up, I was present, I, I, I said yes, I, <clears throat> I talked to people. It's so incredibly important to talk to people. Talk to people about what you're doing, you know, because you never know who you're sitting next to in a plane. You never know. Like it's so important to not keep things so close to your vest that you miss out on opportunities for people to help you. So here's like, I'll, I'll just tell two really quick stories because they're kind of fun. One of them is that on LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn is a wealth of, of information and I wholly uh, encourage you to find people and, you know, message them. I messaged the CEO of Lyft at one point, and he wrote me back, the CEO of Lyft, and, and actually wanted to help me get Lyft embedded inside of my Holly Blue app so that I could help get nurses like discounts on Lyft. So it's amazing the people that you can reach out to. Never, ever be afraid to reach out to anybody. It doesn't matter who you think they are or how big you think they are, that they'll never write you back. Well, who cares? If they never write back, they never write back. But if they do, it's pretty amazing. So uh, one thing that happened on LinkedIn was that one day I suddenly got a message on LinkedIn and it said I had a LinkedIn voicemail, which I didn't even know that LinkedIn voicemail exists, which by the way, it doesn't. But I got this message and it said that you have a LinkedIn voicemail from Mitch Cream. Now, Mitch Cream was the former CEO of USC Keck and Norris. That's a huge hospital here in Southern California. Very reputable. You know, I don't know how many of you know who, who USC Keck and Norris is, but they are massive. And I was so excited. I was like, oh my God. This guy reached out to me. He sent me a LinkedIn voicemail. I can't believe this. What am I going to do? And I tried to pick up this voicemail and it, like, it was some link. It didn't work. I wrote him back, messaged him on LinkedIn, and I said, I'm so sorry. I can't seem to pick up this voicemail, but can you, you know, here's my phone number. Can you call me? And I get back a message that says, sure. So I was like, oh my gosh, he's going to call me. This is very exciting. And so a couple of days go by. And I don't hear anything from Mitch Cream. And I was like, I was pretty bummed. But then I go back to his profile and I notice that there's a phone number on his profile. And I'm like, who puts their phone number on a LinkedIn profile? That's bizarre. But then I thought, well, it must be his office number. So I go ahead and I call it. It's 7.30 in the morning on a Friday. And I'm still laying in my bed. And I, I pick up the phone, I call the number and this guy picks up and I said, hi, Mitch. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, hi, I'm Kara from LinkedIn. And the, this, it was very quiet on the other side. I said, we were having a, a, a message exchange on LinkedIn and you had sent me a LinkedIn voicemail, but I couldn't pick it up. And he goes, Oh, Kara, I'm so sorry. I had a virus on LinkedIn and it sent this spammed out message to all these people. And I, I think I might even have to close my account. And I was so bummed. But then 
a second after I was bummed, I thought, well, I have him on the phone now. <laughs> so I talked to him for 45 minutes and he became my mentor. And now he is the men he's one of the mentors for my company and he sits on my board of advisors. And he is so actively involved in Holly Blue. All because of just like this random thing. So, you know, take taking those opportunities, showing up, you know, I think somebody wrote something down in the chat. They were asking something. Uh, you had said, uh, if they don't write back, then it wasn't meant to be. That's so true. You know, exactly. If, if they don't write back, well, then they're not the right one. Um, but I don't know how many of you have heard of Alignable, but I've just, Alignable is like a small business social networking app for, uh, for, it's a social networking or professional networking app for small businesses. It's kind of like a LinkedIn for small businesses. They started out 200,000 businesses, like three years ago and went all the way up to five and a half million. I reached out to their head of growth, Gabriel Ferrara on LinkedIn. And I said, would you mind jumping on a phone call with me? I'd really like to learn more about what you did for Alignable. Well, guess who came to work for Holly Blue? Gabe Ferrara from Alignable. So, you know, you ne like you just never know what's going to happen when you reach out. You you might think that oh, this person's not going to have time for me. They're too busy. They have this C-suite position at this huge company. You never know. Um, so I just I I wholly wholly encourage you to, you know, just say yes and just show up. <laughs> Well, Kara, that was great. I can't thank you enough for doing this webinar tonight. Um, does anybody have any last questions for Kara so we can, we, you know, went on for a good hour. So, um, any anyone last have any questions? questions for my dogs? <laughs> whining in the background. <laughs> well, it's been uh, an honor and a privilege for me to be um, on this on this webinar I um, faith has my my information I can also put my um, I'll put my email down here in the bottom um, so if anyone has any questions or they uh, they want help with maybe some consultation or they they want marketing advice or they want somebody to help them with marketing or you want help with social media, or you want help with sales, um, or you have more questions about investors, um, or even building out a pitch deck, uh, you are more than welcome. Oh, Katrina has a question. Uh, sorry, Katrina, I missed you. Go ahead, Katrina. Oh, well, hello. <laughs> I did. I just realized that it was you. I was like, wait a minute. I was like, wait, <laughs> it's Katrina. <laughs> I, I am loving this, um, this energy that you're bringing to, to those of us who are entrepreneurs. And I just wanted to say thank you. Um, your inspiration. I just more and more encouragement. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I, I, I love, I love Katrina. She has such a, I, I won't call you out here because I, I owe you a call out, but I won't call you out <laughs> with all these fine people. <laughs> okay. Cause she, knows, Cause she knows what I'm going to ask her. <laughs> but um, I'm ready. I wouldn't have shown my face if I wasn't. I know, I know you wouldn't have. So I'm super proud of you. Um, yeah. She's going to, she's going to be amazing. She is amazing, but she's going to do some amazing stuff. Thanks to you. So I just want to let everybody know that, that, you know, besides everything that you've already told us that I, I am, I hold testament to everything that you've said and shared here today. Oh, well, thank you so much, Katrina. You're, you're wonderful. <laughs> well, um, anybody, anybody else before we, before I let you guys go on this fine Tuesday evening. 
I hope that you, I hope you got something out of this, but if uh, you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, I'm always happy to provide whatever kind of support or um, resources that I can. And it, you know, you're already a part of a great organization. Sanciel is here to support you. And um, I'm just glad that they, they asked me to share my experiences with you so that you, know, you, can, you can go on and, and fulfill your dreams of entrepreneurship and hopefully avoid some of, some of my mistakes. Thank you, Kara. And if you don't have a, a membership to Sanciel, I highly recommend you um, join Sanciel and um, because we do have amazing nurses um, and amazing founders that can help you through a whole lot more and um, other programs that we have coming up in 2021. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, everybody have a fabulous week. Stay, stay well, stay healthy. And, um, and keep pursuing those amazing dreams. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to do this for us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. You're, You're welcome. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.